So I was going to uh, give a lecture that was partly about um, summarising where we are with our knowledge of climate change, at least the way I see it, and then to sort of um, hopefully engage you in answering this question, which is how far should we go to stop climate change? And the reason that's relevant now is because we have a kind of, despite Trump, we still have a commitment internationally that we will try and avoid 1.5 degrees, or at worst, 2 degrees. And actually, because of the delays, that means there are only certain options open to us. That's what I'm going to argue. And those options aren't really being debated. And I'd quite like to expose them to you and then get your views, really. Um, as we go through, I'm very happy if people want to ask questions. I mean, it keeps it more live. So if you've got a question, quite often they come up at the time and you think, oh, it's kind of faded. Please don't hesitate. I won't necessarily see you. So wave or shout or throw something at Sebastian. And, uh, and I'll try and answer the questions. Um, okay, so um, the title is How Fast Should We Go to Stop Climate Change? But I want to just explain the framing of that, and that's really about telling you about some of the science. As you probably know, um, it's very difficult to see the truth about climate change. I'm a climate scientist, I spend my whole time thinking about it. I still get confused by newspaper articles. I think, really? Has it stopped? You know, is it all over? Is it nothing to do with CO2? It's very difficult to see the, the wood for the trees. So some of it's about that, um, and reframing that, really, because the way it's presented in the media is not really how it is. Okay, so the thing you do see quite often is this record, and I could show you, and I will show you some from other centres. This is actually from the University of East Anglia. It was involved in a huge hoo-ha about 10 years ago when there was an email leak. But actually, the data from this is as sound as a pound, or sound as a euro, probably. Uh, maybe, not that, maybe more sound than that. Um, these are anomalies of temperature, they are calculated relative to some nominal period. You can choose your period, but this one's 61 to 90. So where it's blue, it's, it's been colder in that year, and these are global means, so very simple Stevenson screen measurements, some of the measurements over the side of ships with buckets. And these anomalies are relative to this period here, which is why it looks, you know, it looks like it's at zero. And the thing to notice about this is the thing that got people excited about climate change is that from about the 70s onwards, it's really been nothing but warm years relative to that period. And the record only goes back, this particular record, the global record, only goes back to about 1850. But over that period, it's been unusually warm in the last 40, 50 years. Um, and there's other things to notice about this, of course, is that even in the global mean, where you're taking long time scale averages and you're taking annual means, there's a lot of variation from year to year. So you hear people say, and I'll talk about it shortly, you know, this is, I'm going to get my shirt out because it just came out halfway otherwise. Um, uh, you know, 2016 was unusually warm, and it was, but you always have to see this in the context of the longer-term change, because there is weather, of course. We will always have weather, and weather involves variations that may or may not be to do with climate change. Often they're not. There's stochastic variability on top. The basic facts are it's been unusually warm. Surface temperature increased by about 0.8 on, if you look at the long-term trend, since 1900. Six warmest years, all since the 2005. And the really amazing thing is we've had three consecutive warmest years on record. So 2014 breaks the record, then 15 breaks that, and then 16 breaks that. That's partly because we had climate change, and it's partly because we have a huge El Nino event in the tropics, which make things a bit warmer. But it's still unprecedented in the, in the record. Okay, so really something going on um, in the system. And 2016 was about um, 0.86 in this record, 0.9 above the 60 to 90 thing, which actually means it's well above one degree warmer than pre-industrial. Just keep that figure in mind. It's like 1.1 degree. The discussions in Paris are about avoiding 1.5. Okay, so on that basis, if that was a long-term change, that would be pretty close already. But the way this is always presented is it's about that record, and it's as if um, scientists just thought, okay, well, how are we going to explain this? Let's fit it. Let's fit it to the CO2 record. Let's fit it to something else. Let's fit it to solar variability. But it wasn't like that. And it's never presented this way round, really. But the, but the amazing thing about climate change is that it would be bizarre if, it, if the planet wasn't warming. In fact, we'd all have to give up. All physicists would have to give up. Because way back in, um, in the late 19th century, a number of people, this is, uh, Arrhenius was not the, the first person to think about um, greenhouse gases. But he was the first one to make a kind of back-of-the-envelope calculation of how much the planet will warm with CO2. Um, he was doing it, actually, because he was interested in the glacial and the glacial cycles and explaining those. And between glacials and interglacials, CO2 changes quite a lot. 
but it turns out he did a calculation. His calculation was some, when you translate it, it was something like if you double CO2, his estimate would be somewhere between 2 and 6 degree warming. Okay, a factor of 3, and you think, well, that's not, it's a long way out, Svante. You're not getting the Nobel Prize for that. You've got it for something else. Our range now, after 100 years, is still a factor of 3. It's 1.5 to 4.5. But it was a remarkably close. Without supercomputers, without most of the data, this was just based on understanding of how CO2 particularly absorbs uh, long-wave radiation, heats up the planet. And here's his paper. I love this. You won't be able to read this very well, but this is the, um, the London, Edinburgh, and Dublin Philosophical Magazine and Journal of Science. And I've just put under, underlined here, is the mean temperature of the ground in any way influenced by the presence of heat-absorbing gases in the atmosphere? And you don't ask a question like that in a paper unless you think the answer is yes, right? I mean, it's just not worth asking it. Or you'd ask, is the price of beans related to temperature? And he mentions Fourier here, the famous mathematician who'd actually done some experiments that led to the name the greenhouse effect, even though it's a rather silly name, um, using a black box. Uh, one of his colleagues had shown that the air inside the black box, when it had a bit of uh, glass across the top, got warmer, like a greenhouse does. And that's where the name came from. And the basic idea is fairly straightforward to uh, put in a picture. Um, some of the details are complicated, which is why we still have this uncertainty about the, um, about the magnitude of the change to expect. But, you know, where you haven't got clouds, there is interception of shortwave radiation from the sun by water vapor, but on the whole, 70% or so reaches the surface. Some of it gets reflected back because the surface is not completely dark. The rest of it warms up the surface of the Earth. Like all bodies, the Earth's surface radiates like a black body does, like anything that's warm, and it radiates at certain wavelengths because of its temperature. And it just so happens that the, the, the wavelengths it wants to radiate at are also the wavelengths at which greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide absorb. So if our planet was very much warmer, it wouldn't be such an issue. But it turns out it sits right in the window where it wants to radiate. Okay, so this is my... I like to say this is my electron microscope picture. Uh, it's a very... It's sometimes called the Mickey Mouse mode. So at 15 microns, where the Earth wants to radiate... The CO2 molecule does this. It has a resonance like a child swing, and it therefore absorbs and it re-emits. And when it absorbs, it absorbs some of the radiation that would have gone out to space and caused the planet. When it re-emits, it absorbs in both it emits in both directions, so you get less radiation going out to space, and you get some coming down to the Earth. And that's the basis of the greenhouse effect, really. And the really neat thing about this, since Arrhenius' time, is we've understood all this absorption of greenhouse gases in terms of the motion of these molecules. So they generally have uh, three or more uh, atoms in them because then they can do the sort of motions that absorb in the right frequencies. The other one you get with CO2 is called the asymmetric stretching mode where you have kind of like an like a, um, executive toy. The carbon sort of bounces between the oxygens like this. That's another frequency that absorbs. Okay, so the really neat thing about this is this is not mysterious. This is like swinging your kid in the garden, right? This is, except swinging it with microwaves, which wouldn't be very, would be slightly cruel. Um, okay, so when you look at the top of the atmosphere, this is what you would see if you were in the shuttle, you had the right instruments. This is the emission of radiation as a function of the wavelength of the radiation. So because of the Earth being a black body, it wants to radiate like a black body, which is this shape, it's called the Planck function. And there are these huge big chunks taken out of it. And each one of those chunks is associated with one of these motions of a greenhouse gas. So the green line here is this bending mode that I just showed you, 15 microns. As a result, loads of energy is absorbed at that frequency that would otherwise have gone out to space. Okay, and we know a lot about the greenhouse gas absorption spectra. Uh, water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas. So you hear people that are skeptical about climate change say, well, how can CO2 matter when water vapor is such a bigger deal? That's true, but water vapor, of course, is... We have a big ocean. Water vapor turns over rather quickly in the atmosphere. So the water vapor concentration in the atmosphere is pretty much determined by how much water the atmosphere can hold, and that itself is determined by its temperature. So water vapor, even though it's the strongest greenhouse gas, we think of as a feedback, because if we warm the system up, we get more water vapor. If we get more water vapor, we get more greenhouse effect. It is the largest of the amplifying feedbacks, though. Okay, so this is going to be, so 
All of that Arrhenius' stuff came before anyone, like Charles Keeling had measured CO2 increasing at, at, on Hawaii. And we now know that CO2 did go up. I mean, Keeling had been measuring it from the 60s. We'll see that record shortly. We also have very little, despite all the other debates about climate change, we have very little debate about whether the CO2 emissions are significant, where they've come from. That's kind of agreed upon. The real debate is whether it matters. I'm going to try and show you this movie, which is not my movie, but I kind of like it. Um, this might not work. This is now going to do YouTube clip. Okay, so can you see that okay? Right, so um, the first thing to notice is that whenever I feel smug about the UK's position, I look at this and it shows me that we started the whole thing off because the Industrial Revolution started first. So if you look at the integrated carbon, the UK is still a bit of a villain because we started out. Now you see it spread out right across Europe and then you see the eastern seaboard of, of the US. And as time goes by, this is the year down here, and the number of tons of carbon being emitted by each location, you see a bright light, looks quite pretty actually, of industrialization. And then you'll see gradually, first the US, then India and China really wake up towards the end. And China is now the largest emitter, not per capita, nothing like it, but in terms of total amount of emissions is larger than the US. And you can sort of see this spring spread out, the industrialization spread out, it's been a good thing in general for humanity. But there's been this consequence that we, um, we have all these CO2 emissions now. And we know, oh, I'm going to have to turn this off, it's going to get very loud, excuse me. Um, we know very well where the CO2 emissions come from. No one's really arguing about that in any great detail. We argue a bit about where carbon ends up, um, but not about that. And then this is the most famous record in environmental science. This is Keeling's record that he started taking on uh, Mauna Loa on Hawaii. And I think when he started to take this, people thought, no, are the, um, the funders of US climate science, and hopefully continuing to be, but under pressure, started to fund him. And you can see at various times, you can't quite see here, but there's little breaks in the record where they stopped funding him. And I spoke to his son, Ralph <coughs> Keeling, uh, Dave, Ch or Charles Keeling is now dead, unfortunately, but he, and apparently they just forgot they were funding him which is why we had this long record. They just, they, they just, no one ever checked. And it was like, in those days, no one cared. And he just kept doing it. They thought, the crazy guy's going up the mountain again. And we ended up with this amazing record. Now, on the face of it, this record is kind of obvious. If you increase CO2, keep pumping out CO2, then the atmospheric CO2 is going to go up, right? So that's the trend here. But my last five years of my career, and quite a few high-profile papers, have come out of understanding... This oscillation here, so this seasonal oscillation comes about because there's more land in the northern hemisphere than the southern. So when plants are growing in the summertime, CO2 is being taken out of the air. And during the wintertime, when the soils are decomposing and there's no photosynthesis going on, the CO2 goes out. So actually, when you look at Mauna Loa, it tells you about the breathing, if you like, of the biosphere. And what we've found recently is that these cycles here, can't quite see it here, have got bigger through time. And that's one of the few positive things about CO2. Plants grow by taking up CO2, so it looks like, and we expected this theoretically, the productivity, the amount of photosynthesis going on in the system has been increasing. But the other things you notice about this is that the variation in the growth rate is large. So let's look at, for example, the very large um, El Nino event here, or here was Pinatubo, a volcanic eruption, cooled down the system a little bit. During that time, decomposition, which is the counteracting term, so basically it's photosynthesis taking carbon in, decomposition releases it, the planet cools down, decomposition slows down. It's a bit like putting your cheese in the fridge, right? It doesn't go off site quite so fast. That's what went on here. And then the opposite happened during a, the big El Nino. The planet got hot, and the vegetation, particularly the forests and the soils, released carbon to the atmosphere and accelerated the growth rate. So when you look at the long-term trend, it's totally dominated by human emissions. When you look at the variation about that trend, which is very significant, it's totally dominated by the natural world, predominantly by tropical vegetation. Okay. Um, there has been an increase of 50 parts a million since the human impact was described as discernible by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which I'll come back to shortly. And that's a kind of, that makes me sort of ashamed, really, is that we could, we could have convinced ourselves that we were changing the planet, 
we're changing the climate and yet we've not really managed to do anything. In fact, when I look at this, I think, well, how could I... We could mark on here where the, um, where the various climate negotiations had been. I don't think you can see any change, really. So even though we have been talking about it for a long time and there's a wider acceptance, you look at that record, you think, hmm, I'm not sure I'd know. If I, if I just looked at the record, would I know we'd started to act? And I don't think we would yet. So we're greater than 400 parts a million now, and that's the highest level for at least 800,000 years. Now, um, we can put this in the context of the Ice Ages. So as I said before, Arrhenius was interested in explaining the change in CO2, well, the change in climate between the glacial and interglacial. These are interglacial periods. This is going backwards in time in hundreds of thousands of years. The interglacials have higher CO2, typically about 280 parts a million. The glacial periods, which are much colder, more like 190 parts a million. And as, uh, as Al Gore once did, but I'm going to do it in a slightly less smooth way, we can put on the recent increase, and it's essentially, when I plotted this, I thought I've made a mistake. It's just vertical, right? We are basically pushing the system, as far as CO2 is concerned, at least during this quaternary period, it bounced between 280 and 190, and we're now at 400, and we're going outside very, very fast. Now, the thing that Sebastian and I got interested in that got us talking, first of all, made us friends, was actually understanding what rates of change mean for a system. So we often wonder about whether taking a system into a new regime implies an instability in it. We've been thinking about what it means if you really push the system fast. Do you sort of break its ability to adapt? And that's still an open question. Okay, so all of that stuff led to the setting up of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is not a political talk, but I want to frame it because the debate about geoengineering is now going to become much more prominent because... UNFCCC is saying we must avoid 2 or 1.5, okay? And the UNFCCC is, the, the documents are very dull, but this bit is very important. This is the bit that counts. So the ultimate objective of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations, so flat, flat lining, in the atmosphere at a level which would prevent Dangerous anthropogenic, anthropogenic meaning human caused interference with the climate system. So this is the key term here, dangerous. And who could argue that we'd want to avoid dangerous change? But if I did a show of hands on what you think dangerous means, what sort of risk you're prepared to take, you'd all have different views. It's a very subjective judgment. If I went to the low-lying states as, who were pushing the 1.5 target and said, what do you think is dangerous? I think we've already passed it. We're already getting flooded. If you went to Vladimir Putin and said, do you want it to be warmer in Siberia? You say, yes, please, no, we're near dangerous yet. So when you, when you put in these subjective terms, you do make a rod for your own back. And some of the work we now do on tipping points, these abrupt changes, is kind of trying to get the politicians out of that mess. You need to be able to have an objective assessment of what dangerous means for anyone to agree upon it. Okay, that's an aside, though. Right, so amazingly, despite very little progress any other way, in Copenhagen in 2009, when there was a last, a huge burst of optimism, the, one, uh, the, the, the last time we had it recently was Paris, but before that it was Copenhagen, and we all went there thinking we're going to push the door open, and it turns out the door was made of concrete. Um, but what was agreed was what dangerous means two degrees of global warming for pre-industrial. Remember, already at 1.1, if you believe this year, maybe at 1, and lags in the system mean it's more like 1.5, most likely. Okay. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, not the Inter Independent Police Complaints Commission, but some people think it is, um, provides scientific background for the negotiations. So when the UNFCCC was set up, they set up this other body. It's rather unfortunate it's called an Intergovernmental Panel. I'm involved with the IPCC. I'm nothing to do with government. I mean, there's no sense in which you're controlled by government or anything. We're scientists, but this is what we call the IPCC. And there are loads of us. This is just one of the meetings. This was in, this was in um, New Zealand. No, it was in Australia, actually. Uh, Tasmania. And these are just the authors that happen to have travelled around the other side of the world, creating loads of CO2 emissions, it turns out, um, to work on the Working Group 1 chapter. So 209 lead authors. We are called lead authors, and sometimes we're called the IPCC lead author, but just bear in mind there are hundreds, literally hundreds of people. And just so you know it, that's me there. 
in a yellow T-shirt at the back where I belong. Okay, so what did the IPCC stay, say in 2013? And we'll just explain some of this. And then we'll see where there's a kind of contradiction emerging. So the first thing is the obvious one. Warming in the climate system is unequivocal. We've seen the global warming record. You can do it from that. If I compared lots of global warming records, and people are constantly doing this because they think these have all been fiddled. Um, they've all been fiddled in exactly the same way, as you can see. Um, then you can see that all these records, this is a, these are US records here. Uh, this is one from the UK. These are corrections that are made occasionally when people find there's been a problem with some measurement, like this, the buckets over the side. But the basic trend is very similar. In fact, the, the um, interannual variability is quite similar. Uh, and these recent warm years are very clear in all of them. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Well, they are, and I think um, you could argue, well, so the, the, the skeptics might say, well, that's because they all use the same data. But you also have to, there's a degree of processing involved here. So with some of these data sets, for example, this one, the UK one, there isn't any gap filling done. You just take averages of the data you've got. So you've got a sparse data set. There's some bits missing, bits of the Arctic are missing. In others, like um, uh, the NASA one, there's some gap filling done by sort of smoothing the data. But they give basically the same sort of global temperature record. Okay. A lot of debate was about this thing called hiatus, which was a supposed slowing down here. And I think there was a slowing down, even in the corrected data. But it shouldn't surprise us at all, really, that that happens. I mean, there is such a thing called weather, and it isn't all about climate. And when you look at these records, you are seeing both stochastic variations, random variations from the weather, and long-term trends. So many of my colleagues got involved in horrible, heated debates about whether the hiatus exists or not. And I think, well, I think it probably does, but it doesn't matter. It's not relevant. You know, you can look at other periods where there's been unusually fast warming, and we should also not imagine that's a part of a long-term trend. I have to look at this in a longer term perspective. Okay, so if you look at it, and this is, as we go further back, of course, things get more uncertain. So these are reconstructions from tree ring data. This is the very infamous hockey stick that some of you may have heard about. So it's got this hockey stick shape. So these are reconstructions largely from proxies, mainly from tree rings, but not entirely from tree rings. And you'll see the, the, the uncertainty in these is much larger as you go back in time because you're not getting direct measurements. Um, but this is a more recent reconstruction, and you can see that the observational record on the proxy is both a long way outside the variability during this period. In fact, if you believe the general shape of the hockey stick, the planet ought to have been cooling now at the time it's warming. And in fact, in the recent past, we believe solar variations would have, on, on the whole, made the planet cool slightly, but it's actually been warming fast. Okay, so the IPC says, IPCC said that the 30 years prior to the last report um, were probably the, 30, 30, the warmest 30-year period of the last 800 years. And actually very likely, there's this language in the IPCC that uses colloquial-sounding terms to mean precise probabilities. Greater than 90%, that means. Yeah, of course. The, the effect of what you've been describing in terms of human impact in terms of accelerating mm. temperature and change has translated what otherwise would have been a benign, relatively benign, low amplitude in the glacial the Holocene right. into one like the last of the glacial where you have much higher values than the yeah. yeah. um, This is the direct impact of, of our human impact on the planet. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the thing, isn't it, that, that when you look at Holocene records, you probably know this better than me, but the, work, the climate looked peculiarly stable during the Holocene, during the, peri the period of development of civilization. And you just think, well, it wouldn't have been so obvious if it wasn't so flatlining, so, so calm during that period that something happened, you know, during the, glacier, uh, during the industrialization. So I agree. I mean, it's, it's almost like there was a, um, you know, people talk about the Anthropocene now as a geological epoch because it is this huge spike we're going to see. Hopefully it's a spike that just, <laughs> it doesn't just go, um, but yeah, I agree. So I think uh, in the context of the longer term, if we look further back in time, it would be even clearer, I think. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I just want to clarify my understanding. This yeah. is limited. But on past evidence, mm. somewhere in the next one or two, third year, we, 
the general direction of travel would have been towards another ice age. And yeah, probably over the era. Yeah, yeah, tens of thousands of years, yeah, yeah. most likely. The really interesting thing is that probably we won't have an ice age at these CO2 levels. And there is a, there's a very interesting parallel. We, so some people would say, let's go back to the pre-industrial era, let's go to 280. So you got to 280 parts per million and you would have another ice age. Would it be the right decision to go, if you could get to 280 to go there? And I'm not sure it would be. So we are at that point where we have to make pragmatic decisions. We're going to have to control, in some sense, atmospheric composition. We could choose to control it so it isn't entirely natural, but to our benefit. Or we could say, nature's what counts, we go back. And that's a kind of like a geoengineering concept. Is, is it right to modify the system for our benefit, even though it's not entirely as it would have been without us? But I think that's the point, is that you, know, that you won't see a glacial at these levels. Maybe not at 350. Um, thanks. OK, so the other thing that's very, very clear, and is it remarkably clear this year, is that the, um, the amount of Arctic sea ice we have that's reflective, uh, that has a big impact on ecology in the high latitudes, has been declining over the period of observations. And most of the recent observations are in this past year when we've got satellite records. But we are getting records broken year on year in this. And um, it's one of those feedbacks in the system that's easy to understand, right? You warm up the system, you melt ice and snow. Ice and snow are bright. You re reveal something like dark water or dark soil. More sunlight is absorbed, you get a further amplification. We call this polar amplification, and it's largely caused by these albedo feedbacks. So summer Arctic sea ice extent is about half of what it was in 1950. Um, 4% decline in annual mean Arctic sea ice extent. Okay, and this is just, um, this is now an old picture, but it's the nicest one I've got. This is what we would have expected in the norm, uh, to be the norm in the extent in the, um, so this is uh, the low in Arctic sea ice looking down on the North Pole. Um, and this is the record we had in 2012, which was um, less than half of that. And the recent years are similar, um, so very big declines. Some of that could be variability, but the long-term trend looks quite, quite clear in there. On the whole, climate models do not get these sort of trends. Okay? So sometimes you hear people say climate models are oversensitive. They are in some ways, but in this way they're undersensitive. They do not get this degree of decline of sea ice. Right, so human influence on the climate system is clear. This is a slightly more complicated thing in that you, um, you have imperfect models. We have sparse data. And somehow you've got to say something about the probability of what you see in the observations being human caused. I'm going to show you a, I'm going to try and show you a YouTube clip here. You will recognise one of the people in this. My mum insists I show it. Um, right. I'll turn this up a bit. Now it turns to the truth about global warming. Don't shout. For the first time, legendary broadcaster Sir David Attenborough speaks out about global warming. The key question, of course, is how can we distinguish between variations due to natural causes and those variations of the climate that are induced by human activity? And the key thing that convinced me at any rate was a graph like this one that we marked out on before that had been prepared from climate scientists like Professor Peter Cox. Now explain to us the significance of this graph. The same okay, what we're going to do is to take a walk through time. And the first thing to note as we walk through is that this, the climate is naturally variable. This is a spiky beast. Occasionally there's a downward trend that's associated with a volcano going off that cools the system down because of the dust it throws up. But generally it just oscillates around. And then we get to a period around about 1910 where you can start to see an upward trend, a warming of the climate, a global warming if you like. And the issue is, what caused that? Was that humans or was that natural? So what we do to try and work that one out is to take a climate model and to put into the various factors. And what we can see with this green curve here is a climate model that includes just these natural factors. So this is when volcanoes go off and the output from the sun. And you can see that the green curve can reproduce reasonably well this mid-century warming. So up to this point, you could reasonably argue climate variation can be explained by natural factors. But as we move on, we can see that's no longer true as you get to the latter part of the 20th century. From about 1970 onwards here, 
you can see the red curve, the observed temperatures, and the green curve really beginning to diverge. And the question again is what caused this recent warming? So we run the model again, we include human factors, particularly we include the greenhouse effect, from, uh, mostly from carbon dioxide that comes from fossil fuel burning. And then we get this yellow curve, and we can see, as well as reproducing the mid-century warming, we get this recent, rather rapid warming we produced. And that tells us two things. One is that the model looks realistic, it looks like the real world. And the second thing, the model tells us that this recent warming is due to human beings. So there you have it. There seems little doubt that this recent rise, this steep rise in temperature, is due to human activity. If you look at the green line of natural variability, it's clear that without the action of human beings, there would have been far less temperature change since the 1970s. Right, so um, if David says it, it's true. Um, Especially with prompted by you. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that he, um, he cottoned onto it, which is why I was doing the program, but when we were doing that, and this was 10 years ago, he seems to have got younger, I seem to have got a lot older in 10 years, and he's got, he's got 10 years younger. I think he took some years off me, I don't know what happened. Um, he's basically said to me when we were doing that, why do I have to say this? We well, didn't have to say it, but why is it me saying it? Why is it not the climate scientist? And I think he genuinely thought it would have as bigger impact if I said it as he said it. And that's, that's not, I mean, this thing here has um, been you know, seen a million times or something, and I'm, I've only shown them 800,000, so it's 200,000 other times this has been seen. Um, and it has a huge impact when someone like that says it. Even though they believe it to be true, they won't say it because they think, well, I'm not an expert. But what that was about, um, what we were trying to talk about there was this concept of detection attribution. So this is, um, this is kind of nice language to use but basically what you do is you say well I've got these models that can give me an estimate of how, what patterns of change I expect in space and time for each thing so it could be the sun's output that's varied it could be a volcano I could put those into a climate model and then I can run that model and then get a load of patterns for different forcing factors and then you do the simplest statistics you can imagine you find the patterns of those from um, f from very simple analysis and then you do a linear combination that fits the data and if that linear combination have coefficients like one, it means your models reproduce the data very well and you've attributed the change. So this is what allows the IPCC to say things like, we are 95% certain that global warming has been caused by human beings in the last 50 years. It's because of this detection attribution. It is actually very simple statistics that even I can almost understand. And this is what's in, um, in the IPCC report of that attribution process. So it's done through that process of, it's called optimal fingerprinting, which makes it sound fancier than it really is. You look for the pattern of different forcing factors. And this is what you find then. So of the observed warm, which is the black one here, this was only up to 2013, the greenhouse gases account for more than this. So you will see on Twitter at the moment people saying humans account for more than 100% of global warming. Um, they, sort of, they sort of don't because they also account for this. this is, these are particulates in the air, particularly aerosols associated with burning sulfurous coal. Rather ironically, this dirty coal produces very bright particles. And when you see ship tracks from above, which is very dirty fuel, they are very, very bright. So this, this is a fortuitous counteraction of our global warming record, which is the GHGs, because of other pollutants. And as time's gone by, we've rightly thought, well, actually, it's not very nice having this nasty air, so we'll clean it up. We'll have we desulfurized petrol. We will, um, we will just clean up air quality. And what's happening is that these pollutants are very short-lived, so when you stop polluting them, the cooling drops rather rapidly. CO2 is very long-lived, so it stays around. So you get this rather unpleasant kick in the teeth for doing the right thing with this, which is that you clean up the air quality and you get a bit more global warming. One of the geoengineering approaches I'm going to talk about is to say, well, how about this then? So maybe this would be a good thing to have, but we don't want to breathe it. Okay, so why don't we put this stuff up in a stratosphere where we don't breathe it, where it cools down the climate system, and we can try and stabilise the climate anyway. We'll come back to that. Um, so the thing that really leads us to this whole debate about whether we need geoengineering is this statement here, limiting climate change will require substantial and sustained reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. I would say it requires more than that. And actually, if you look at the IPCC figures, you really can't do it through just sustained emissions cuts now. We've probably left it too long. Okay, so these are the sort of scenarios that people come up with. These are called um, 
uh, RCP scenarios, which is a really terrible name, representative, representative concentration profiles. They try to stabilize the CO2 at different levels in the atmosphere. And they go from what you might consider to be a very fossil intensive uh, scenario, like RCP 8.5. This is the one we've been very close to until now. And RCP 2.6, which is the only one that avoids two degrees. Okay, so this is the one that is most consistent with the climate targets that UNFCCC are talking about. And in between there are others. So basically, um, now when we talk about 1.5, we have to go lower than this one, okay, in general. The spread around each of these scenarios is because we don't really know the climate sensitivity. Remember Arrhenius' number of 2 to 6? Well, that's 1.5 to 4.5. There's a factor of 3 uncertainty in the long-term sensitivity. Okay, so mostly what you see in, in when you look, look at discussion about global warming is just that. You look at the global mean. And it gives the impression, you know, frankly, if someone said to me, it can be two degrees warmer in your garden all year round, I'd go, thanks very much, I'll take it. So it gives the impression somehow that there's, um, there's a uniformity to it, that it's, there's, a, there's a predictability to it, and it doesn't involve other changes. So just to show that, and I hope this works, so just to show that briefly, this is a climate simulation from the Hadley Centre, quite an old one now, showing the temperature anomaly relative to the pre-industrial in a pattern, right? So thing to notice about this is the, um, this is a business as usual scenario. Warming is much, much higher over land than ocean. Unfortunately, we live on the land, so we are going to get more than the average warming. There are certain parts of the world, particularly the high latitudes, because of the sea ice albedo you know, feedback where you get a lot. Now, from 21, under, 21 onwards here, there is no change in CO2, so everything else is lag in the system. This is the time scale it takes for the ocean to warm up. So where you see this warming up, this is just because it takes a long time for heat to penetrate in the ocean and for the surface ocean to get, to get warmer. I'm just going to show that again because it took me ages to set it up. Um, okay, so, so the warming is largest in the high latitudes. This is what we call uh, um, Arctic amplification. It's warmest, warmer over land. In this model, there is a horrible thing that happens, which is that the Amazon forest dries out and dies. We don't think that's likely, but there's still a risk of it. There are parts of the globe uh, in the tropics that, that stay cool initially and then get a warmer. And the oceans warm up less than the land, but they warm up eventually. And as they're warming up, they're expanding, so you're getting sea level rise. Okay, and these, so these, this warming here in this model is probably about three degrees globally. But find me a place on the land surface where people live where it's anything like three. More like four and a half or five or six. So quite often when people are talking about global warming, they're underestimating the impact because we happen to live in those places that warm most. It's all good news. Yes, although the pattern, uh, so what you can do is crank this pattern up and down. So if we did RCP 2.6, everything would be up and down. But it turns out the pattern is very robust across models for a given model so there's this kind of fingerprint spatial fingerprint of this and you do always see this fact that the land because it's kind of got an, a, a less effective heat capacity warms up much faster also with the land of course it dries out and if it dries out you get less evaporative cooling whereas the ocean never does that it's always got evaporative cooling but yeah you can crank this pattern up and down but for a given model you can't change its pattern very much you can change its amplitude okay so this is what the IPCC says um, Global surface temperature change by the, for the end of the 21st century is likely to exceed 1.5 relative to 1854 scenarios. And I was a bit confused by this. I thought, where, where did 1.5 come from? This is before the, the Paris talks, and I was an IPCC author. It was obviously with reference to what was likely to be discussed in Paris. But this is the understatement of the century. So here's, um, and I, I'm a strong supporter of the IPCC, but this is the two degree target written in terms of pre-industrial. This is RCP 2.6. There's a good chance you wouldn't meet that with RCP 2.6. Okay, and we'll come back to what RCP 2.6 means. 1.5, where we're looking at here, on the scenarios that we looked at, you've got very little chance actually of avoiding 1.5 degrees. Okay, and the band here again is uncertainty arising from uncertainty in the climate system. So these, these things are uncertainties with socioeconomics, and arguably we've got choice about those. We can choose, in principle, how much we emit. But the band is the uncertainty. And I, my corollary to this is, well, it almost certainly exceeds 
the two degree target for all but the most aggressive mitigation scenarios. So when, when I went briefly to Paris, and scientists aren't allowed in the negotiations, um, not scientists like me anyway, that might say something, um, there was all this discussion about 1.5 and I felt a bit tricked by it. I mean, I, I, I was pleased with the optimism, but I, we, I went there thinking, we've got to tell them. We know we're near two, we're near a three. And I, we all got sort of sidetracked. So they sort of put this shiny thing out. 1.5 is over here. Don't look at the three. Don't look at the two. Look at the 1.5. And actually, there was an optimistic bubble, which was good in a way, but it needs to turn into something. And it also needs to become real, because let's talk about what it means. So let's look back at, back at these scenarios again. Remember, this is the only one that has a, about a 50% chance of avoiding two degrees, RCP 2.6. You'll notice that emissions peak about now. Uh, they always peak about now in these scenarios, and then they come down, and they go negative. So think about what that means for a minute. This is a standard scenario on which the two degree vision is based, and that's negative emissions. Um, so what do we mean by that? So mostly, if you ask policymakers, they'd say there is no geoengineering in, in these scenarios. We're just doing sort of standard technology. How could you get negative global emissions without doing something really radical? And actually what these uh, scenarios assume is a thing called BECCS. It has nothing to do with David Beckham. It's biomass, energy and carbon capture and storage. So basically you grow lots of biofuels, you burn them, you capture the CO2 and you bury it. It's kind of a neat idea because when you're generating energy, instead of putting CO2 out, you're taking it out. Um, the problem is it probably requires a huge change in the landscape. We've got to do biofuels on a huge level. I mean, we've got to be taking out, we're currently emitting, um, well, in these units, it's about 35 gigatons, so we've got to take out that much per year and store it somewhere. So safe storage is an issue and just the technology of doing it. But assumed in these scenarios, which are considered standard, is this idea you'd have negative global emissions. So if China's emitting or the US is emitting, the rest of the world will take that out and their own and be negative overall. So that is an amazing assumption to make. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's like a moonshot times 100, okay? And yet, when is that debated when you talk about two degrees? When does anyone ever say, hold on a minute, we're talking negative emissions here. Do we actually want to do that to our landscape? I'm not sure. Okay, so the elephant in the room is geoengineering, actually. Um, the term is not used very widely. It's mainly used as an insult. People who do geoengineering research are kind of crackpots. Um, through time, it's, it's fluctuated in and out of respectability. If you look back at uh, National Academy of Science reports in the 60s and 70s, when they were already flagging up climate change, no one spoke about reducing CO2 emissions. They just said, let's geoengineer a way out of it. Okay, and that's because it is feasible scientifically. It shouldn't be done without proper debate, though, which is what this is about, really. Okay, so this is like love is. Um, Geoengineering is deliberate large-scale intervention in the Earth's climate system in order to moderate global warming. And there's two ways you can do that. So if you imagine when you increase CO2, you sort of make the duvet on the hot body of the Earth thicker. You can make the duvet have less togs again by taking some of the stuffing out, taking some of the CO2 out. You could do that, and that's called, um, that's called um, what is it called? Carbon dioxide removal. The other thing you can do um, is to just make the planet a bit brighter so it reflects more shortwave radiation. The main, the main flux coming into the system that makes everything happen is the solar radi irradiance, of course, 342 watts a meter squared. If we double CO2 in the atmosphere, we are talking about an additional energy input of about four watts a meter squared. And that leads, we think, to maybe three or four degree warming. So it's very sensitive, these imbalances. So here's an idea. Why don't we just reflect four watts a meter squared more of that, okay? Why wouldn't we do that? I mean, if we were doing this scientifically, we wouldn't deal with this one. This is, we've, got to, we've got to store hundreds of billions of tons of CO2, take it out of there and store it. Why don't we just make the planet brighter? There are reasons why you might want to, not want to, but you could sort of see scientifically why it makes sense. Maybe not socially. Okay, so carbon dioxide removal is basically making the duvet thinner again. You can think of solar radiation management as making, and imagine you're out sleeping in the daylight, um, making the duvet bright so it reflects sunlight. 
So, carbon dioxide removal techniques. So, this basically involves removing CO2 from the atmosphere through biological, chemical, or physical processes. And when I show you those negative emission scenarios, they assume this thing called BEX, which is growing vegetation, I think quite a natural thing to do, burning it and burying the CO2. That's one way to remove CO2. Quite a good way to do it, but quite intensive. I mean, it's a lot of land, as I said, a lot of storage. And there are ways you can do that. So, reforestation, apart from biofuels, you could reforest. For a while, you would take up a few extra 100 gigatons of carbon, probably. There's an issue about ocean fertilization. So there's parts of the ocean where the primary producers, the, the plankton, are limited by micronutrients like iron. So maybe you just put some iron on the ocean. People have tried this. You might get a bloom, maybe take up some CO2. We don't think for very long. Then there are people working on these high technological things, which are, I'll show you a picture of now, which are essentially uh, capture from free air devices that would be based on physical principles like gels that absorb CO2. I think we've got one here. Um, so if you did it this way, it would be slow to reduce temperatures because we've got to crank down. We've got, what have we got, an extra, um, what is it, 120 parts per million, so maybe 240 billion tonnes of carbon to take out. Once we take that out, some comes out of the ocean in compensation, so it's more like 400. 400 billion tonnes of carbon we've got to take out, so we'd better get started soon. Um, it is com expensive compared to conventional carbon capture and storage. So one of the amazing things about this whole debate about climate is we don't do the obvious, which is basically when you've got fossil fuel plants, why would you not take the CO2 out of the flue gases, which are high concentration, and bury it? Yeah, what happened to that? There was, there was a whole push for that in the 80s, mm. I don't really understand. I mean, I think it's um, the market mechanisms aren't there for it. Um, there isn't a willingness to invest from government. So UK government, for example, put money and took it out. Um, there is an issue that you tended to build the old power stations nowhere near where you wanted to store the CO2. But I still think, you know, you still think, well, if I was the fossil fuel industry, I would be invested in this because it keeps me in business. It hasn't happened. I don't really understand why. If someone can tell me, then we... Yeah. And it is, so, so the... The, the, the reason this is cheaper doing it that way is because you're talking about thousands and thousands of parts of a million flue gases so you can take it out more easily. Yeah, the only issue is that you have to transport it a long way. So the advantage of free air capture is that you can do it here. Maybe you want to store it there. There's a store there. Do it right at the top. You can do it in your garden. In principle, you can do it anywhere. But it's, it's not that efficient. This is a low risk, though. How would anyone complain if we just took the pollutants out of the air we'd put in originally? take CO2 out, we reduce ocean acidification, we reduce climate change in exactly the way it would have been increased by CO2 increases. But that depends on safe CO2 storage. And this is a lot of CO2 we put out. It could be used to reduce CO2 below the current level. So we could choose to go back to 280 and we might risk an ice age. Or we could say, well, let's keep it 300 or 350 so we don't have an ice age. Okay? But it's slow. So if we had an emergency... And some people might say, some people are actually arguing that the Arctic sea ice is an emergency. There's an Arctic sea ice emergency group that lobbies government, thinks that lots of methane is going to be released from the high latitudes once geoengineering done. You wouldn't do it with CO2 removal. It's too slow. You can't do it in a rush. But you can do it with, um, with SRM. But this is one of these things. So this is actually old now. Klaus Lackmann, who's at Columbia University, was previously somewhere in, where was he? Somewhere in Germany, I think. Uh, this is kind of like a car radiator, imagined, and it's got a gel in it. And the, the, the air flows through it, and the gel absorbs the CO2 because it's just got the right size to let other things through but capture the CO2, which is quite a heavy molecule. It then gets washed out, so you wash this out and you kind of get carbonated water. I don't know what you do with it, maybe you drink it. You just have to all sign a thing to say, I'm not going to belch. Um, but basically, you can, in principle, do this. It's expensive, but it's not, it's not rocket science, actually. To remove CO2 from there, you probably did it in your lab experiments in chemistry. Took CO2 out. It's not efficient, but it can be done. It's not, it's not nuclear physics. OK. But that's all slow. Even that would be slow. But solar radiation management is not. So when a cloud comes over, you notice it straight away, right? Because you've reflected some sunlight, you've changed the short wave at the surface, the energy balance has been immediately changed. And there are various variants of this going all the way from the quite parochial and sweet sounding like we'll all look like uh, the Mediterranean, we'll have white roofs. And in fact, Stephen Chu, who was Obama's first science officer minister, was really great, a Nobel Prize winner, 
back this. I think this is slightly silly because you need a lot of roofs and we don't really want that many roofs on the world, I don't think. And also, they tend to get dirty. So I think this is not a very effective way to do it. You might do it for adaptation, so the reason people do it in hot countries is because it means that your local environment's cooler, that makes sense. Cloud brightening is seriously being considered by people, not least the group in Manchester. So clouds are bright because they've got small, part, uh, small droplets. If you can make those droplets smaller, the cloud gets brighter. We call this an indirect aerosol effect. And actually this has been happening by chance. Is the effect I mentioned that when you have pollutants in the air, like over, over ship tracks, clouds are really bright. And that's because there's lots of condensation nuclei, which means lots of droplets. And lots of droplets means very bright clouds. Stratospheric aerosols is the one that's really difficult to rule out because this is what volcanoes do, and we'll come to this in a minute. If you just said, let's cool the planet down like a volcano does, you have a natural experiment to, to look at. And space shades, which are really sci-fi but kind of fun. Right, so um, this is fast to reduce global temperatures, right? We can, if we cut the shortwave radiation at the surface, we would get an immediate effect. So in that sense, it's good you could do it in an emergency. It's cheap compared to conventional mitigation. That's because you haven't got to lug around 400 billion tons of carbon and remove it. But the, the caveat to this is it's cheap. The direct costs are cheap. Right? We have no idea about the indirect costs, really. We know that we could put this stuff in the air with, say, B-52 bombers that are otherwise being unused, I hope, um, flying high up and spraying sulfur out the back. Turns out four of those would do the job. It is much, much cheaper than fixing our entire economy, um, probably. Um, but it has high risk. So CO2 goes up, the ocean still gets acidified. And if we just cool the planet by making it brighter, we will mainly cool the planet where there's lots of sunlight, so in the tropics. Remember our pictures of global warming, all the warming's in the high latitudes. So you'd have to do something. You'd either have to deal with the fact that you're not counteracting the full change, you're getting global changes, uh, regional changes, or you'd have to do something fancy with the high latitude ecosystems. People have suggested this, but I think it's getting to the point where you think, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we know that much about it. But you could argue that if you want to do 1.5 degrees, maybe this is what you're talking about. And at no point has a politician ever said, I'm backing this. I back 1.5, but I'm not going to back that. It's kind of probably not consistent. OK, so you get regional climate change, ocean acidification, and the thing called the termination problem, which is because this is short-lived, if I stop flying my B-52s, it will drop out within a few years. I'll be left with high CO2, and then I'll get a very rapid warming. And as as Spastin and I have been finding out, the rate of warming is probably the really difficult thing as far as damages are concerned. So the flip side of this is always that, um, OK, so we have a termination problem, means you have to keep doing it. Um, the flip side is you could switch it off. <laughs> so I often say, well, it, that does mean if it, went, if it went wrong early on, you'd be all right, you just switch it off. If it went wrong later on, you've got a bit of a problem. The reason this is of interest to um, people that don't normally care about climate change like security services, this can be done by a single nation or by a rich individual. So Bill Gates could do this. Richard Branson might even be able to do it. Together they could definitely do it. Um, the individual nations could do this. Um, in fact, it's not even illegal right now. You can dump things in the air. It's not even illegal. It's illegal to dump things in the ocean, but you could do this, and no one could say that's wrong. It's rather bizarre. Okay, so here's just an artist's impression. I'm nearly finished. I'm, I'm, yeah. Given that the mixes are made with all this stuff I see, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is a. Yeah. And I look at photographs and documentaries. Yeah. Photographs of my friends. Yeah. And they're not talking about this at all. Just the photographs recently of Paris, and there was chemical trains all over the sky. Yeah. There, so um, there is a huge, um, well, huge. There's a very vocal group of. Um, I will unkindly call conspiracy theorists that think this is already going on. And I, I get letters from them, and in the US people get really handed about this. So the weird thing that is, if you're a, someone who's spoken about geoengineering in, some, in the sense that it's something we should consider or at least rule out and study properly, you get it in the neck from environmentalists because 
you're basically using a sticky tape to fix the problem. And then you get the chemtrails guys saying, you're already doing it. <laughs> and you're really squashed in there. What, what gets me is, I always like the red trails. You see yeah. the jet, and you see the trail, yeah. and then it disappears behind it. It's all yeah. well. And these things are there long after they're gone. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. Seeing, what's that? I don't know. Yeah, so if you have very high, um, high clouds, so clouds have this double effect. So we mainly talk about the shortwave effect, which is they reflect sunlight, which tends to cool the planet down. But they're also very strong greenhouse absorbers. So the radiation from the surface comes up to the cloud and mostly gets absorbed in the area the cloud's cover it, covered. And then the cloud re-radiates at its temperature. So if it's a very high cloud, um, it actually has a net warming effect because it reflects the shortwave, but it gets this very strong greenhouse effect from the fact it's got very high temperature radiation coming out and it converts it into low temperature radiation because it's high. So some of this is just based on a misunderstanding of what high clouds do in the system. In fact, if you wanted to cool a system down, you'd remove high clouds from it because the strong greenhouse effect. And some of it, I don't even know where it comes from. It's almost like there are these conspiracy theories that pop up and they won't go away. There's a kind of, um, same thing happens a bit with climate deniers is that there is a strength in being in a very small minority as a kind of sense of identity that means that they are incredibly difficult to dissipate. And you get to the point where you just say, okay, there is a group over here that we're never going to change, but we'd be stupid to spend all our time trying to change their minds when the rest of us have decided we need to do something. But chemtrails is an example of that. There are, there are ones on the other side of the debate as well, where people are catastrophists in a way that isn't necessarily helpful and think everything's being hidden. So we get people saying you're, you're understating it, some saying you're overstating it. You think, well, when we've got one on each side, we've probably got it about right. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, all right. Um, so this is just an artist's impression of some of those things. And these are, these are things that are being developed in, um, in Manchester. They're supposedly automated boats that would just spin. These, these are columns, these columns spin. They're not putting out smoke, they're spinning up sea salt. And sea salt is one of these things that will create nuclei in which clouds can form. And they create brighter clouds. And when I was in the Met Office, the last, one of my last acts was to get one of my team to the guys, John Latham and um, this the other guy, um, I've forgotten his name now, they came and said, look, we think this is a real issue, can you try it out in your models? And I'm thinking, well, I think it's nuts, but let's try it. Uh, I don't think it's going to do any good. It actually had a huge impact on climate in the model, but it's very regional and patchy, right? So, so in this case, you're probably just going to affect the marine stratocumulus that tends to be on the west coast of continents, and that means that you affect things like monsoons. So you might cool down the climate, but you might also monkey with monsoons. You think, well, I don't think I'm going to do the trade. But it would probably work in a regional sense. And, and these are the guys that actually are connected to this Arctic Emergency Group who want to do this in the high latitudes to try and cool down the Arctic. I wouldn't advise anyone doing it yet. Maybe never, but at least thinking about it shows the seriousness of the problem. There's the space shade. There's cloud brightening ships. The one that's really difficult to rule out is this idea of mimicking volcanoes. So this is the Pinatubo eruption in 91 in the Philippines. That's the sort of volcano that happens every so often where you get a lot of sulfate going up into um, sulfur dioxide, going up into the stratosphere. It oxidizes the sulfate, which is bright particles. Those bright particles reflect the sunlight and cool down the system. And we can see that very clearly. This is actually um, an estimate of what happened to global temperature. Pinatubo went off about here. You'll see that rather ironically, this big volcano cooled the system down by about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 degrees, which was about how much it had warmed through climate change for the previous 100 years. Okay, so you see immediately, if I was just interested in global temperature, why wouldn't I do this deliberately? Would that affect the long term, or is this really well? So, it's indeed, so what happens here is that eventually, so if it's in the stratosphere, it will last years. So you can see this record here, about five years, and then it decays again. If it's in a troposphere, um, it's days, so it would be a stupid thing to do. We'd be breathing it all in. In the stratosphere, you'd have to renew it. So the termination problem is that if I, if I stop here, if Branson thinks I want to make records again, I don't want to fly planes, then this thing will happen, and you'll go back in five years, whereas it might have taken 50 years to get there, and that's the termination problem. But it also means you can switch it off. The problem about switching off as well is if you mimic this type of volcano, yeah. 
So we're likely to get a super volcano kind of off bang quite, yeah. quite yeah. realistically. In, 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 so you've got yeah. a synergy which is going to develop yeah. here. That's a very good point. And so do you know what's going to be the outcome of that in terms of your climate mm -hmm. where you want to go? Yeah, so if you were here, for example, and you've got a big volcano on top, you have it too cold. Yeah, that's a good point. And actually, I'm going to come to this in a minute. There are regional differences. You can move the entire band of rainfall in the tropics, which is called the intertropical convergence zone, by whether you do this in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. Okay, and some cases for the good, sometimes it's for the worst, some cases a weapon in principle. Okay, so this is what you would do. Um, so the most, this isn't the B-52, this is a jumbo jet, but it needs to fly in the stratosphere, in the mid-stratosphere, where it lasts for years rather than days. If it lasts for days, we're breathing in the stuff. We avoid climate change, but we all get lung disease. It's not good. We actually were involved in, um, when I was um, running a so-called sandpit, we were involved in, in supporting research on a project, this crazy project. So basically you have a balloon the size of Wembley Stadium holding up a pipe, because the issue with this, the main cost of this is actually getting the sulphate aerosol into the stratosphere, and then you pump it up here, and it comes out here. But this is a 10 kilometer pipe, okay? So when we were doing this experiment, I, I was leading the discussion about what should be done, and I wanted journalists to see what this looked like. I didn't want a 10 kilometer thing because when that comes down it wipes out 10 kilometers, but I wanted a one kilometer thing that the journalists could see, partly because I wanted to see how serious it was. Actually, we were stopped from doing it, so there's a com campaign called Hands Off Mother Earth, which actually now is predominantly pointed at people that have spoken about geoengineering, and I'm very proud to be on a blacklist for this. Um, all we wanted to do was just show this is what it looks like, so what, what one kilometre pipe looks like, we could do it, we're going to spray water vapour out, I want you to see what it looks like. And then, as the public, you can say, don't like it. But actually, we weren't able to do that. And of course, I was very naive, because even a one kilometre pipe needs one kilometre exclusion zone. That means you have to do it in a military base. You start to do things like this in a military base, it doesn't look open, no matter how much you try to make it look open. So it was, a, it was a PR disaster that I've learned from. But the work was being done on this. So this is a huge material science question. Can you, well, for, you probably can create the balloon. Can you create a pipe here that's sufficiently rigid that you can have 10 kilometer pipe that would not be so heavy that you couldn't possibly lift it up? Okay, so let's just do a show of hands. So how many of you think geoengineering is crazy and should never be contemplated? How many of you think we should do it now? How many think we should consider it? We're doing it. But not deliberate. So that, that's an issue, isn't it? Right? So when you do something deliberately, isn't the burden of proof so much higher? The reason I would say consider it yeah. is this bottom line question, do we know enough about yeah. what the impacts would be? Yeah. So there's lots of techniques and many that you, you yeah. haven't had time to, to yeah. mention. But do we realistically know, like the, the volcano yeah. effect, what it will do yeah. uh, over the time scales we need to act? Yeah. But bottom line, yes, we have to act and yeah. not just sit on the bottoms and do nothing. Yeah. The tricky thing is, how will we know that except by doing it? So we can do model experiments. I'm going to show you one in a minute. Um, but we can't actually, and you think, would I, would I back that? I'm not sure I would, but as you say, we are kind of putting pollutants out accidentally, so... I would be careful, and I'm, 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 I'm many times have created deserts, and yeah. we're geoengineers. Yeah. I mean, how, how much deliberate was it that we created large deserts in the world? It was, wasn't it, for agricultural... Yeah, but that wasn't the end game. It wasn't what we were aiming for. No, no, no. But it, right, we did it. We did it. Yes, I agree. So that's a really tricky question, though. And there's a, there's a thing that, um, that people talk about, which is, uh, what's it called, moral hazard. This idea that if you give people a safety net, they just take more risks. And one of the big issues that policymakers hate about this is it gives the impression you don't have to deal with mitigation, the hard problem mitigation, you've got, you've got a quick fix. Now, many people would say, well, okay, a bit like this audience did, let's think about this, let's not do it, for goodness sake, but let's think about it or work through it. And you might argue, you might well come to the conclusion, this is no substitute for cutting CO2 because we're going to have residual climate change, we have this ridiculous control problem that someone could shoot down an aircraft or a balloon and we're going to have a termination problem. Let's do the hard thing, remove CO2. But I'm going to just pose this. Now, this, this is really difficult, I think. So... A colleague of mine at the, at the Met Office, who also works part of the university, does these model experiments. So he's not putting actual stuff out, but they can do experiments where they put aerosols in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, or uniformly across the globe. 
And this is just um, one of the places that would be affected. So this is the anomaly in Sahelian precipitation, so sub sub-Saharan Africa where we have lots of droughts, lots of, especially in the 70s, but even recently uh, some horrible uh, uh, food shortages and droughts. And uh, what he does here is he switches on at this point geoengineering. And his first one, he's switching on it in both hemispheres at once. Okay, and you might say, well, there's a slight increase in rainfall, maybe. Not a lot, but maybe a little bit. This is where geoengineering begins. Now, not much change in risk. If you did it in the northern hemisphere only, you would have a permanent drought here. Because basically what happens is the intertropical convergence zone that brings the rainfall here when it does bring the rainfall sits over the hottest part of the sea surface. And if you cool the northern hemisphere, the hot hottest part of the sea surface is further south and the rain never reaches them. Okay, so that's like, man, this would be an absolute disaster. It would also be a horrific weapon, which is why for the first time ever, um, the security services are interested in climate change. Now imagine you were a nice president like Obama and there was a drought going on there. You wouldn't do that, but how about if you did the opposite? So if you did the opposite and you said we're going to do geoengineering in the southern hemisphere only, now you make the southern hemisphere cooler than the north, the rain band moves north, you end the drought. How cool is that? You end the drought, it is over. This is going to green the world in sub-Saharan Africa. Now the, now the moral question is much harder, right? So we're not any more arguing, um, can we do this instead of, of, of cutting emissions or removing CO2? There is no way to do this quickly in any other way that I know of. But this is very robust. The models disagree on lots of things. They do not disagree on this. You can move this band around. Yeah? So who loses on that matter? That's a very good question. Can you imagine? Right, so um, what happens here is um, tropical uh, Atlantic Ocean gets hotter. And that means you get much stronger hurricanes hitting Florida. <laughs> okay, so, um, and that's the, that's the brilliant question. There is no win-win situation here. Obama would have to be pressing this button or Trump, very unlikely, but pressing this button saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to trade the well-being of these people who can probably deal with it because they're ready for it with the well-being of these people that haven't. But I just think the most amazing thing about this is this is, this is weather modification or climate modification that looks extremely robust across the models. You can move this great big snake of rainfall around in the system. And I don't know what the right answer is in that case, but if I had the button, I'd be tempted this point, Is wouldn't you? Indications for other parts of the next year, like the Pacific Islands and the Amazon that already have um, rainfall. Yeah, so it does have an impact on northeast Brazil. Mm -hmm. So you, there's a kind of dipole thing that if you move the move the ITCZ around, one gets wet and one gets drier. So you're still doing that trade. You're basically saying there's loads of rain in Brazil. We'll reduce it a bit, mm -hmm. and that's a really difficult thing for anyone to do. But you, it's just to recognise that there are, and these are the best models we've got. There isn't evidence that we could do quite crude things and when you put things in the hemisphere it kind of it kind of smooths itself out in that hemisphere and doesn't go over the thing and you would over the equator and you would change the climate significantly in those areas. Okay. Could, couldn't you have a percent percent minus button? The, <laughs> the um, uh, drought yeah. lasts a certain length of time. Yeah. You pour water in that sorts the problem for a certain length of time. And then switch off. Then it's switched off, yeah. and then you correct yeah. what happened in, in the other place, and yeah. Yeah. switch it over. And back. that's a very good thing. So if you had this for a while, what you would do is you'd make Sub-Saharan Africa greener. And we know in that part of the world, there's, there is a possibility of two states. So in the mid-Holocene, actually, it was green in the Western Sahara. So you might get, change the state of the system. You might be able to do it for a while, but you still have to get agreement for a while Florida's under bigger risk and northeast Brazil gets a bit drier. So it's one of these things where you imagine if we can't agree on cutting CO2, yeah. are we ever going to agree on this? Well, we won't. But would someone do it unilaterally? Well, they might. They might. Coming back to yeah. the moral dilemma, I think, yeah. is that it's very attractive, this sort of approach, because it appeals to what we as humans have always done, experiment, push the boundaries, and not really concerned about the, the consequences. What's got us to this position yeah is the fact that we want greed, we want, we're greedy, we want to make our lives more comfortable. Yeah. And we're at this sort of tipping point, not just with climate, with lots of things, with yeah. our technology. And it's this real cusp. Either yeah. we do something quite dramatic like yeah. this, 
and push forward, and yeah. through that barrier we don't know about, or we pay more attention to the things that have actually got us here, which is our whole economic system, and yeah. how those things are, are feeding yeah. into it. A sense on it that it's, it's very hard to get debate on this, yeah. and it's a way the IPPC and you know, all that goes with it is almost like a religion, and a quick fix like this doesn't entail the appropriate level of suffering in terms of getting to a to a solution. And it's almost as if, yeah. like, even some of the points that you presented tonight yeah. are heretical, really. I mean, normally, yeah. one would expect you to be ejected in certain, <laughs> in certain places because the debates are impossible, and particularly on the geoengineering. It's very difficult. It's not even possible to to start the discussion. Yeah. I, I mean, to make yeah. a laugh of all the, the people that have worked so hard to give us the difficult solutions. Um. Yeah, so, so the argument that would, would say, well, um, because of the whole issue of the fact that you don't deal with the climate change problem associated with CO2, you have to reduce CO2, ocean acidification, all sorts of other things. But the argument that some have used, and I think quite persuasively, is that imagine that you did think 1.5 was dangerous, and there's no way to do it except by doing this for a while. Would you do it? Or would you just say, let's wait and see? And if it, one of the things about this is because it's fast, you can kind of wait and see. You can't wait and see with CO2. If you think CO2 of 450 parts per million is dangerous and you get there, there's no way to crank that that quickly. So some people have argued you might chop the top off, but you need, a, you need an exit strategy. And you still need to do the hard stuff, just buy yourself a bit more time. Any other comments? Yeah, I have yeah. to say, I mean, I, I think potentially the, um, the, the, the pressure it creates for business as usual, you know, yeah. mitigation going out the window, I think is is worrying because yeah. we have a government, for example, that stands full square be, be behind a, an agricultural sector that yeah. regards as absolutely critical for our, our economy, and we have the highest per capita greenhouse gas emissions in Europe as a result yeah. because of you know seven million cows. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, whilst we try and argue for a process of reducing those numbers, yeah. moving towards a more diversified uh, farming system in, in the effort of, of achieving, at least coming to alignment in, yeah. in, in terms of our European commitments, this seems to provide a cop-out, a, a yeah. exit strategy. You know? Yeah. So there's an interesting thing. We, we, I was involved, involved in a Royal Society report in 2009, which tried to make this respectable because the Royal Society is respectable. And they did a little survey, because we were all physical scientists really, one or two social scientists, so they got in a group of people who have never heard about geoengineering. And they said to them, well look, okay, here's this climate change problem, how likely are you to act on your carbon footprint? And there's like 50-50, I might do it. It's not, if they're not doing it, I'm not doing it. And then they said, there's this thing called geoengineering, and they asked them again. Now the moral dilemma solution is they will be less likely to act. But you know what they said? They said, if you guys are crazy enough to think about doing this, this is serious. We do not want you doing this. I'm mending my ways. They haven't, but you know, that, that was the, the reaction was opposite to a moral dilemma. And in some ways, I think the debate about geoengineering needs to be more public because of that reason. Because yeah. you hear so much about climate change. I've been talking about it for 20 years, you know, more than that, 30 years. You just get kind of immune to it. But if you just say, well, hold on a minute, this is what we're talking about if we don't do that, I think at least it's a a wet fish in the face <laughs> and hopefully people do think actually we better do something else about it yeah yeah so yeah uh, well my observation seems to be that there's been had 30 years now of discussing and proposing incremental reductions yeah in reducing so generally descaling and building the system yeah. and precious little has occurred uh, so we've come to this pass yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say things are happening, but they're not happening because of further knowledge about climate change or because of international negotiations, although it might be that what that does is it creates, um, um, it seeds ideas in people. So the solar cell thing that's going on at the moment is pretty extraordinary compared to what I thought would have happened 10 years ago. You know, the efficiency of photovoltaics, the cost of PV energy, such that despite the fact that I despise almost everything that Trump says. I'm less worried about the climate problem than I am about pretty much everything else he says, because I think that's, an, that's a juggernaut that won't be stopped now. And, uh, and even, even in, you know, single, when economy takes over, I just think there's nothing you could do about it. And I think we've got to that point with certain types of renewable energy. It won't be quite quick enough to avoid two degrees, but two degrees is a, and 1.5 is a political construct. 
really. And there is no reason to believe everything ends at two degrees. It doesn't. It gets harder and harder as you get further out. So maybe we have to be grown up and say, actually, rather than go hell for lever at 1.5 and cut down all our forests to do it, or do geoengineering, we are going to prepare ourselves for 2.7, and we're going to do it properly. That may be another way to go. I mean, we might have to give up the idea that there is a dangerous level, and rather than just increasing risk through time. So what is the point where you get debate, really, to refocus from the geoengineering of a wall across yeah. the southern United States <laughs> to the geoengineering that you're talking about? I think How do uh, we do that? I, the weird thing about um, the positions that, 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 um, that Bush, George Bush would take, for example, and I suspect Trump as well, is that on the one hand, they don't think climate change is real officially, and that on the other hand, if they were going to deal with it, they wouldn't do it by reducing fossil fuels. They do it by geoengineering. So in a strange sort of way, it becomes attractive to them. And you think, well, this is kind of conflict. There's, nothing, there's no problem to solve. Why would you do it? But high technology is often quite attractive too. So there is a danger this becomes... I want it to become a subject of debate, but I don't want it to become respectable. Not yet. <laughs> yeah? Um, there's a lot, I, I've never read you know, any IPCC yeah. reports before, but there are obviously a lot of targets mentioned and a lot of targets come up in the media. Yeah degree rises and all that. Has there ever been agreement across a lot of nations as to a target in putting a, an amount of GDP towards renewable energy and, and the research of renewable energy? Um. Or is that something I don't think it's G in GDP terms. Of course, there is, there is things like clean development mechanism, which have been partially helpful and partly used by whoever wants to make money out of them, but some use of thing comes out of them. So there is, and there's an adaptation fund now, isn't there? There's a green adaptation fund, so the nations that are responsible for most of the change are putting aside money for people to, in principle, adapt to it where they can. So there is a bit of that. I mean, I think there is a degree of agreement there. But I suppose over the years, I've just thought it's not going to happen top down. It, it, there's no... There's no body that's going to be able to make this go away just by saying it will go away. You know, in the end, it will be done by people doing things bottom-up way so that solar cell technology has been developed for all sorts of reasons, not necessarily motivated by the climate problem. Electric cars in a similar way. People do different things in the way they do their farming practice and how they use land. Maybe all those things will eventually get the problem solved, but they'll take longer than we think we've got to avoid two degrees. It seems that if you could capture the spirit of the space race or something, yeah. which yeah. happened for a lot of the wrong reasons, but yeah. you know, what, I was talking, came, what came out of it was incredible. Yeah, we were talking about that over lunch today, which is, can humankind do a big, uh, meet a big challenge like this without having a conflict of some sort? Because the space race was a kind of conflict, wasn't it, in a, yeah. in a gentle sort of way, or a war. The other time we have huge acceleration in technology yeah. when there's a war on be nice if we could do it without either. <laughs> so we, we, don't, we don't attribute any value to what we're doing, like the, like the question that the gentleman had in the CCS. Why would you do it when you can put your rubbish in the car and take the yeah, in the country and throw it over the wall? Yeah. Why do you pay for a bin service? So yeah, to have a, a carbon price or something, well, it, it is a carbon price and sets them at the appropriate level, is what yeah. provides the incentive I think for right. to do. I think you're right. And I, I, I'll tell you one thing, but it's, it's kind of confidential. So when I was on the DEC Science Advisory Group briefly, um, we were discussing CCS, and I was asking naively, why is this not working? It seems to make total sense. And someone who was an expert on it said to me, um, if you had CCS capability on your plant, and some do, it would never be in your interest to turn it on. So basically, there was no point at which the electricity price would encourage you to capture the carbon because there's no price for it. It would only cost you. So why would you do it? So if you're just running a business, you couldn't go to your shareholders and say, we've done it for the good of the world. There was no incentive to turn the damn thing on, you think? And, and I said, well, that's ridiculous. And I said, well, that's the way the market works. I said, well, change the market. I mean, the markets are supposed to work to do the right thing. You know, so there, carbon prices want something like that. It's very difficult to imagine doing it globally and getting an agreement, but there's no reason why you can't do it locally, and some nations are doing that. You have to be careful of leakage then, because, of course, all the dirty industries move out. But if we had one thing that the UNFCCC did, which was that we agreed a carbon price that got cranked up through time, then the rest of it would happen, yeah. I think. You've not mentioned the index system services, but which yeah. seems to be referring to it there. I just wonder where you see the future of that. What you mean in, in this articulation? Yeah, so, so in terms of um, decision making or valuing or both? I suppose in terms of the carbon. Yeah, so um, 
I have some slight concerns that the the Bex um, the embedded Bex assumptions in 1.5 and 2 uh, in order for them to happen would probably be done without reference to biodiversity or the other ecosystem services we have so what we're beginning to do now is to say let's view the climate change problem as one of the hard problems we've got to solve but maybe in the context of something more like sustainable development goals which include things like you know quality of food equality basically things that make people's lives good and if i think if we don't do that we do risk making bad decisions for what for the climate problem and and a case in point is um is actually uh, diesel cars i've got a diesel car I got a diesel car partly because I didn't want to pay so much for my fuel, that's my selfish side, and partly because I wanted to reduce my CO2 footprint. But actually the diesel car is much worse for air quality and human health than a petrol car. And, and that was one of those ones you think if we just joined it up, if I, even if I joined it up in my head and I knew both bits of the science I could have joined it up, then we would not have been incentivising diesel cars and we did do it. Same thing a bit with, um, with the biofuel thing. We could get a situation where the biofuel incentive to get below 1.5 it's such that we remove natural forests and that will be a disaster. So I think you're right, we have to start, even though it's hard for policymakers to, to grasp and makes it more complicated, we have to start seeing this as a, a system problem where we're trying to balance everything off against each other. So we're going to get the wrong answers. If we do think of it that way, we will get these co-benefits. So air quality changes, reducing methane, reduces climate change, reduces ozone, reducing ozone, improves health, improves crop yields. It's obvious, right? You should do that. And yet, if you don't join it up, you just think, well, methane's very small to CO2, let's leave it alone. But actually, all the co-benefits are associated with that. So I think if we can get to that slightly more grown-up trade-off, we'll get better answers. Barry, there is yeah. a risk of hogging the floor. I mean, how does that relate to, I mean, global warming's been called high project, yeah. and this is kind of, kind of what, what goes back on what you're saying, what's coming yeah. from what few things that people said. Something that's almost too big to comprehend in human terms of that the sense that one can do anything yeah. to, to, kind of, to, uh, to mitigate for it just kind of seems to get lost. I wonder whether, whether kind of philosophical problem and issue from, comes into play or does it, does it at all? You mean in terms of it being a wicked problem? Well, I suppose in terms of communicating it and yeah. comprehending it. So I, I, I think um, I think it's it's difficult because it's unpalatable to take the actions that are needed, I think. I mean, actually, the technologies exist to do... They existed 20 years ago to do this, really. That, that, that solar cell technology has improved. But actually, it's not... It isn't rocket science, really, um, mitigating and, and reducing um, carbon footprints. But we haven't done it because we haven't provided the incentives. So things like bravery to introduce carbon tax would have been one way to get around that, and we probably should do that anyway. At some point, we will have to make a tough decision, which is, are we going to give up on these hard-fought targets? Are we going to just say, we're, not going to, we're going to be missing two, so get ready for it, and let's get the adaptation sorted out? Or are we going to do something really radical? And that won't be a decision for any one person. Um, but it, it's almost like the debate is suppressed. You know, It's kind of like, well, let's imagine that we can have the best of both worlds, and we can't, actually. But if you see it in the context of, of meeting sustainable development goals or things that generally improve quality of life. I think it's sort of, the co-benefits are clearer and then it's less of a hard problem in the same strange sort of way. You know, you can, you can justify action on methane because of air quality and air quality because of action on human health and human health because of actions on the public purse, you know, but, but everyone's happy. Yeah. Yeah. Comment in the sense that this is the grown up discussion because up to now it's about if we don't do the following and all the sort of yeah. issues, this is about it's happening, so what are we going to do and yeah. how are we going to do it? And the real practicalities. Yeah. So it's you know, a great way of looking forward at yeah. the various options that could be there. Yeah. But obviously, as you said, it needs to be put into yeah. practice. And one of the problems with the climate change debate is it is so ridiculously polarised. Right? It's very difficult to have a grown-up conversation, with, even with people that are clearly grown-ups about everything else, because it's been politicised, and political discussion on the whole is just a... Punch and Judy show, as far as I can tell. So you end up with this thing where you can't actually take a central position without being attacked from both sides. And we have somehow we have to reintroduce this this idea that it's not it's not a political. You don't make a decision like voting one side or the other, which is I believe in climate change or I don't. You don't do anything else about science like that. You don't say, you know, I don't believe but in I don't DNA. Think, I don't think I think it's making too simple to say that it's, it's politicised. I know two people who are who wouldn't agree with you. Okay, both of them are academic professionals. Yeah. 
highly in, inter, in, intelligent yeah. people. One is an, an engineer, yeah. and the other is a geophysicist or, yeah. or a meteor, yeah. meteorologist. Yeah. And uh, they have seen, I've talked to them, can't follow their arguments, but they have <laughs> very significant reservations about the foundations of the whole thing. Yeah. Um, that's and, amazing. And, and it's nothing to do with the politics. Well, yeah, okay, maybe it isn't. I mean, although um, social scientists often say that you really can't, you can't make a decision even about scientific truths without an element of that. But I, I wouldn't take any notice of them. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it is, a, like we said, there are some people that choose not to believe it, I think, because the evidence is so overwhelming. And it isn't like, like, you know, as I was trying to say at the beginning, it isn't like there was an observational record of global warming and we came up with some fix, it's probably with CO2. It isn't like that at all. It, the, the theory's been around, you know, for over 100 years. It's exact, well, it's, what we're seeing is totally consistent with what we expected to see. Um, the theoretical basis for it is, is there, the observational evidence for it is there, the planet is warming faster than we, we've ever seen before in, in that record. But, but, you're, but you're talking to the converted here. So we, well, I've been yeah, here. I know. Well, so, 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 I, so we tried to talk to the, <laughs> the unconverted or the... Um, but as I said, we could also get obsessed with those, those well, minorities. One, one of the, the unconverted said yeah. to me, he's appeared on RT yeah. and debate yeah. and so on, he said it's very difficult to get a, an opposing sci scientific view up there. For example, he, he was saying that whatever information he has, or whatever yeah. ever, ever argument he has, he says it's very difficult, nearly impossible for him to get that out. Yeah, right. Well, I'd have equal trouble getting on to talk about the flat earth, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> What's the question, Lord? Can, right? Can I just answer right. this one very quickly? Oh, okay. So, yes. so yes. we would actually say, the people that are kind of arguing that climate change is real, that, that the media, at least in the UK, I think in the US as well, wants a ding dong. So basically if there's one person against 99, they'll have one of each. So actually when you've got a very strong majority believing one viewpoint, it doesn't get reflected in what people see. There was a survey done recently that 97% of, of, of published climate scientists believe global warming is real and human caused. And yet when you see, when you next look at, listen to even BBC Radio 4, there'll be one of each. I bet you there'll be one of each. Yeah, in the recent, in the recent, um, uh, debate in the US, they had four climate scientists, I know this is the US and it's Trump world, but three of them were sceptics. So that's 75% when they were only 3% of the population that should have been represented. So I think, I think the opposite is true, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, if you look at 80% of fossil fuel reserves must stay on the ground, not to reach to, to be more yeah. I mean, well, this is a kind of hypothetical question in a sense, but do you think that um, there are, if you like, geopolitical calculations being made by policymakers already that, you know, there's a kind of, you know, realistic, a kind of real politic um, uh, answer to it will be this year, um, uh, geoengineering and the, the idea of really keeping it, uh, you know, uh, two degrees is, is off the... Well, it's, yeah, so for many, it, it's, yeah, for the UK government for a while, at least officially, its argument was geoengineering is not required, we shouldn't even be thinking about it because it will, will reduce the effort to mitigate. But recently, um, the Natural Environment Research Council, which is the main environmental research council in the UK, has funded things on 1.5, which are really about negative emissions technology. So that's changed quite a lot in five years, and that's basically because people have realised if we do continue to pursue these very widely lauded goals, then we are going to have to think about at least ruling out these other ways of doing it. So they're, they're not yet funding solar radiation management, which is a much more radical thing, although EPSRC did fund some things about five, six years ago. But they are funding now the idea of negative carbon emissions, which is quite radical in its own right, really. It's sucking the CO2. Emissions of, you know, if you look to the past, for what the future models, the emissions have gone up 60% since 1992, yeah. it doesn't seem to be any chance that that's possible. Well, there is, there is one piece of good news. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of pieces, but the, the one that's really good is that the, the best estimates of global CO2 emissions is they've been flat for three years. I mean, the temperature's gone crazy, but that's because it's not entirely about the immediate CO2. 
but they've been flat for three years and, and, and the economy's been growing and actually China is getting more efficient. This is a big polluter, but it's emitting less CO2 per unit of economic growth than it used to by a lot, partly because it's renewable energy. So we are at a kind of turning point in global emissions at the moment, fingers crossed, and it will take a while for that to feed through. But they, as you said, they've got to come down. It's not enough under the flat line because CO2 will carry on going up and 20% of the CO2 stays for hundreds of thousands of years. So um, you've got to get it coming down to... Well, people talk... Miles Allen probably spoke about getting to zero emission, net zero emissions, probably by 2080 or something. Yeah? And negative from then on. Any more questions? <laughs> the last comment there. Yeah, maybe two. There were two comments. I think that religion would probably be a better model for analysis than politics because it's in certain contexts it's not possible to offer certain viewpoints, you know, yeah. so that's why we don't have the, the debate on it. Yeah. And, um, they dreaded the social scientists on this, that balance of bias is, is, is quite a significant thing that in, yeah. in having debates you tend to bring a person from either side. So there are some the, people... The, the numbers are 97-1, you tend to find yourself even yeah. in the right situations, you can make 50 50. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Indeed. Okay. Well, Peter, thank you very much for thank your you. very clear.